Um, so first of all, thank you everyone, obviously, for organizing this and also inviting me here. Um, a brief note on the timetable. It says I'm presenting with a colleague of mine, Paul Zeidler. Unfortunately, he's sick. Should I move this away from my mouth a bit? Or? Am I good? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, unfortunately, my colleague Paul is sick, so I'm going to be doing this solo for now. Um, so, yep. Basically, what I'm going to be doing in this talk, uh, as was previously kind of introduced, Terra Zero was very much kind of something that occurred a lot of the time within the art space and very much kind of we were trying to use as a bit of a kind of like a series of experimental projects. And what I want to do, given the context of the festival and opting out, is I want to try and contextualize that within a kind of nilogism which is on, on, the, uh, on the screen up there, which is counter ecologies. So the structure of this talk is kind of going to go as follows. I'm going to kind of go through a brief discussion of counter economics, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, but maybe just so everyone's like on the same page, and then talk about, okay, what, what is this term, counter ecologies, that we're kind of playfully trying to define here. Um, and then hopefully I'm going to kind of contextualize a lot of the work that we did with Terra Zero or try and contextualize counter ecologies as kind of springing out of this and becoming maybe a more um, politically or kind of like action informed way of engaging with some of the topics that we've been playing with for a couple of years. So the main questions of the talk really are, what are counter-economic ecological actions? So what is counter-ecology uh, in a very broad sense? And then also where does kind of crypto fit into all of this? And so, there we go. <laughs> so counter-economics generally is also known as counter-establishment economics. And it was defined by Samuel Colkin in 1974, basically just as a tactic to kind of enable the creation of a voluntary or an agorist society. Um, and this was kind of best expanded upon in his 1980s public, 1980 publication, The New Libertarian Manifesto. And very simply put, agorism kind of dictates or is based on the premise that all forms of association between people should be voluntary. Um, and so it kind of split from, at the time, the US libertarian movement um, in that it followed from its idea of self-ownership, but it kind of really also held the principle of non-aggression as a kind of uh, an integral or like a key tenant to it. Um, and it was basically defined as the study or practice of all peaceful human action that was forbidden by the state. And the kind of things that fall into this category are obviously like alternative currencies, which a lot of the people today are going to be talking about in a new form, but they have existed for, well, centuries. Um, illegal migration, smuggling, mutual credit and mutual aid groups, substance farming, and off-grid energy generation. And this um, graph that's on the board is actually, although credited to Derek Bronze from, ver from his article, Vertical and Horizontal Agorism, uh, actually came from a Swedish academic called Per Boyland's analysis of counter-economics, uh, where he defined possible actions that you can undertake via either there being vertical or horizontal in their strategies. And so a vertical, vertical strategy would be just building local or neighborhood networks of infrastructure. So we have this idea of community technology, obviously something that the Parallel Polis crew are really doing with their approach to kind of introducing newcomers to crypto via having a node set up here, doing the coffee, kind of doing these very locally based introductory talks that are kind of bringing people into the fold of using something like an alternative currency. Um, and then also represented on the board, we have horizontal, which are kind of the more traditional black market approaches to kind of evading or existing outside of the state. So non-state sanctioned trade of any kind, um, which aren't necessarily locale based in the same way that vertical approaches are. And this problem of location in terms of how we can interact with our environment or how we can do something new is maybe a good segue into starting to try and define counter ecologies, this, this term that I threw in at the beginning that I haven't actually explained yet. Um, and I suppose it's based on the idea that whilst it might be viable to actually build counter economies in the traditional sense, especially as with the case with crypto, kind of like when they have a purely digital infrastructure uh, that aren't either locale based or can very easily cross whatever state lines. Um, 
so cryptocurrencies, marketplaces like Silk Road, obviously being perfect examples of this. The problem with counter economies or like counter economic tactics that surround ecologies is that localization is obviously a massively important factor of it because they are usually based around a specific area. And with the case of a specific ecology, um, either this can't move or its kind of state and the problems associated with it are determined by its locale. So the broad kind of initial definition we're playing with and feedback on this during the Q&A or afterwards is massively appreciated because this is the first time we're kind of presenting this, um, is basically seeing what kind of organizational models or what structures we can try and create to like bolster the sort of aims that we were working with or experimenting with in Terra Zero that I'll talk about kind of after this. And so really we can just understand it in spatial terms and its relationship to kind of existing ecosystems. So because there aren't really any new frontiers um, to kind of populate as the cypherpunk movement was kind of populating the digital and kind of like taking it, uh, taking the ground for itself or creating new ground, obviously in the physical world it's incredibly difficult to do that outside of maybe doing something like seasteading, which either requires loads of money or just hasn't worked as of yet. Um, the governance of kind of physical spaces is already mostly mediated either by the state um, or by private ownership or by royal ownership. But all of these things really are kind of already bound within legal frameworks. And so the starting point for this idea of counter ecology was basically the creation of tactical spheres of influence on the ecosphere, which don't rely on the means of optimizing the production of goods or services, um, or, and or kind of integrating this into existing economic or state programs. And very, very simple examples of this would just be kind of the production of non-registered and non-taxed food, um, or the illegal planting of trees to kind of optimize the health of a local biotope. And so you can kind of conceptualize it as as a supply layer on maybe underneath black market, so underneath these kind of like horizontal tactics. Um, that are, yep, still on the board. Um, and so it's kind of environmental action towards ecosystems, which supplies us with material abundance in like a very broad sense outside of this market logic. So for instance, kind of CO2 capture. And really we're trying to reconceptualize the place of material production outside of state apparatus and outside of existing kind of hierarchical corporate structures. And perfect examples of the sort of actions that already exist within these lines and definitely also fall under kind of, uh, definitely also fall under kind of vertical counter economics tactics. The first of which, and maybe the most immediately approachable would be something like guerrilla gardening. So guerrilla gardening is just gardening, growing plants, often kind of vegetables or fruit or herbs that are otherwise useful in spaces regardless of who owns them, if anyone owns them. But quite often it's also done on private land or land that's owned by the state. Um, so they're quite often moved along or there's a lot of tension between the people who are actually engaging with it and the owners of the land. And maybe a kind of larger expansion upon this, which is something that nicely segues into some of the projects we've been doing is um, the work that uh, Carl Hess was involved in a couple of decades ago. Um, so Carl Hess is maybe most famously known for his political writings and his activism. Um, more guerrilla gardening, particularly hardcore guerrilla gardening at the top of trees. Um, so Carl Hess uh, worked with the appropriate technology movement and was involved with kind of creating self kind of like DIY and self managing technology um, in a neighborhood in Washington DC called Adams Morgan, uh, where they basically were engaging in how you can create very easily manageable, easily upkept, uh, rooftop farming, solar grids, um, fish farming in basements, this kind of thing. And it was very successful at the time, on this really local level. And so to kind of go into the next section of my talk, what do Paul and I, or what do I now, because I'm here on my own, um, think that we can kind of bring from our previous experience in the crypto space, obviously in the art space as well, and how can we maybe start bringing these things together and like creating new ways of doing stuff like what Hess was doing. Um, and to kind of contextualize Terra Zero, this started in 2016 
as a project which we were kind of very interested in this history of kind of autonomy in the blockchain space, which was obviously coming out of very cypherpunk notions of autonomy, um, and science fiction as well. And we found a lot of ideas that people had for these kind of autonomous entities existing using crypto in a very, very basic way, in like a very mechanical sense. Um, and this was essentially the, one of the earliest examples that we found, which was just from a thread on Bitcoin Talk, where a user called Jules basically posited the idea that a software agent could exist on its own for the first time because it would be able to pay for stuff like hosting, CPU, and memory using Bitcoin. And because these agents can now own their own wallets, this was seen as a certain mechanical autonomous entity. And this was very quickly expanded upon, especially once Ethereum kind of got going. So this is a, a quote from one of Vitalik Buterin's kind of like relatively early um, larger posts, which actually led to the creation of what we now call as DAOs, where he was kind of questioning whether this human middleman was really necessary for the form of mediation that corporations currently have. And uh, one thing we actually found afterwards was a thread by an author called Karl Schroeder, who actually posited um, something called a Diodand, which was a DAC for a natural system, which actually was had a lot of synergy between, um, well, there was a lot of synergy between essentially what he was positing here, so kind of using these uh, blockchain-based organizational structures that had some element of autonomy, which is the debate, to, like there is a lot of debate in terms of what autonomy is actually there, but let's for the moment kind of gloss over that because I'll come back to that later. Um, but there was a lot of synergy essentially between this thread and the original Terra Zero concept, um, but we found it afterwards. But we have actually since spoken to Carl and he was just super happy other people were playing kind of in the same uh, ballpark as him, so that was pretty nice. But yeah, from all of this, we came up or we kind of presented the original concept piece for Terra Zero. And this came from thinking, okay, what if we actually expanded this idea that, you know, the very simple mechanical agents that kind of Jules presented and, you know, taking some of the kind of organizational mediation or the lack of organizational mediation and the replacing it with contractual mediation that Buterin was talking about. And we took this a bit further. So we actually set up a situation where a plot of land was able to be interacted with and owned via a DAO. So the DAO acted as the mediating in interface between this is ecosystem and everyone else. Um, so it was basically an artwork and a prototype for a self-owned kind of technologically augmented forest in 2016. And it basically just conceived of a framework or we laid out a framework in our concept paper where BioForest was able to just very simply sell licenses to log its own trees via automated processes that were mediated by smart contracts, which now is very simple. At the time, we had to explain what smart contracts were a lot more. Um, and so we, which would be Paul Zeidler, who should be here, and the other co-founder, Paul Colling, um, envisaged ourselves buying a plot of land and then signing this over to a DAO. And over time, the logging licenses and the funds that the DAO would bring in by kind of selectively selling its own trees, so essentially kind of like pruning itself to maintain the healthiest state that was possible, um, it would be able to buy back the land from us. So it was a, we kind of were almost giving the DAO a mortgage initially. And this was kind of a conceptual exploration of how inflexible smart contracts were and how you could kind of tactically use this. So very simply, if you made no technical interface, by which the contract could actually sell the ownership rights to its land to another party, and the land was legally signed to the DAO, which is another big if that I'm going to come back to once I've kind of gone through this explanation, then there wasn't actually any way in a technical or legal sense that the forest could be sold and brought back into the cycle of land being bought and sold and then stripped of its natural resources. Um, so it was this kind of very basic attempt or like very conceptual like high level conceptual attempts of appropriating kind of capital me capitalist mechanisms of resource exploitation and actually laying out how a piece of ground could start playing an active role in economic flows whilst actually also directing avoiding direct influence 
over itself. So this very, very rough approximation of what a self-sovereign ecological entity could actually be. And what did we learn? Oh, sorry, I completely missed this as well. This is just a fantastic cartoon with regards to the <laughs> difference between legal rights and this kind of uh, legal rights of a corporation, which we were kind of playing with and trying to appropriate. Obviously, usually people think of legal rights of a corporation because it is usually this kind of faceless, grotesque thing that makes corporations incredibly difficult to uh, kind of like legally interface with or hold accountable, and we kind of wanted to appropriate that and uh, give it to a forest for better or worse. Yep, and we, were, we, had a very, we had a test site just south of Berlin, which this is just kind of a stripped down satellite image of, uh, that we were kind of just using as a technical playground as well, um, and is still going on as a technical playground. Okay, so what we learned from this, or what we learned from this original concept piece that we've been kind of mulling over for a while, that obviously there's been a lot of development in the crypto and the blockchain space, um, especially with regards to legal interfacing and what DAOs can and can't do particularly effectively. And the first of these, which um, has kind of become very evident in the past two years, you know, everyone said 2018 was the year of the DAO and now 2019 is apparently the year of the DAO again, um, is that DAOs as organizational models or like testers for new organizational models are pretty, like they're very very interesting but the way that they were initially conceived of and spoken of so kind of like hearkening back to this quote of italics this is an incredibly kind of mechanistic um, repositioning of what mediation is. And it's kind of just stripping everything down and just saying, okay, cool, you can immediately and implicitly replace what are actually very complex social relations with quite simple mechanical procedures. And what we've kind of seen in the last couple of years is there's been this, you know, more and more projects kind of engaging with DAOs and like building DAOs is that you have the difference in the structural makeup between the kind of main DAO models. And the first of these, well, the fact that this structural engagement actually exists um, really seems to suggest that actually DAOs are just kind of social solutions, novel social, social solutions to organizational problems that come about because they're kind of bolstered by this, these certain forms of autonomous mediation. But they are still inherently social forms. Um, the social is not being replaced by this kind of completely automated structure. Um, and so Molik DAO, on the one side of this, for those that don't know, is a, essentially a reformatting of the kind of guild model, which is, it's focused around a very specific issue. So the initial Molik DAO was built around funding ETH 2.0 development. And there's very, very little interaction on chain, as the kind of Nick Zabo quote above me suggests. What it basically is, is a guild bank that that you can either add new members to the DAO, and that's voted upon by all the existing members, and they have shares that are delegated to them, and they, they can then use those shares to vote on other proposals. Be those proposals, I as an existing member would like to extract X amounts of money from the DAO for this project, or I as an existing member of the DAO would like to add this other member to the DAO. And that's it. So it's incredibly simple. There's very little interaction on chain and is really, really reliant upon the forms of social coordination and also socially based reputation that are actually far more akin to kind of previously existing co op models. So, really, Moloch DAO is just kind of leveraging the security and the minimal but very secure coordination aspects of something like the Ethereum network to kind of achieve and augment this cooperative structure. And this exists in contrast to, excuse me, larger scale organizations or DAO kind of models like that are coming out of kind of DAO stack development in Aragon who are working on very, very complex systems of having obviously voting on chain, but then also, you know, kind of having tokens representing reputation and the different levels of how much reputation you have and how much financial stake you have actually kind of affecting then the weighting of votes and all of this. So 
the fact that there's this kind of like quite hectic milieu of experimentation with DAOs and DAO structures, um, if anything, kind of just made me want to say that the tech is really just a kind of another substrate to try and build new social coordination models that one. And there's a really interesting tension that kind of arises out of this, but that also arose out of actually trying to take this original concept of Terra Zero and actually trying to implement it. And <clears throat> that tension is actually something that is also maybe a tension that exists within you know, much of the crypto community, or at least the kind of like the crypto community that are kind of more looking towards the or relying or building on the kind of the political um, the political and the kind of like parallel society aims of people like the cypherpunks or you know kind of like relying on an agorist maybe philosophy in some sense um, and that's what this interaction with the legal world is so what we kind of have seen out of what's happening with DAOs and also what we found from Terra Zero was where that limit or like what the scope of autonomy that like blockchain tech can actually give you. And so, is that my, no. Uh, even though we talked about granting ownership rights to a DAO in our original concept paper, um, kind of as an experiment with non-human autonomy in some sense, but also kind of going back to the, the Zabo point that I had earlier as a kind of security measure um, against the land being taken away by kind of making it impossible for the land to be granted to someone else. Um, with the use of real estate or the interaction between real estate or physical space and um, kind of having some kind of ownership denoted in the way that we usually do within the kind of purely digital realm, uh, especially within the realm of kind of cryptocurrencies and cryptography where key access, like key access actually just denotes ownership. Those two things are wildly different. And you have to interact on some level with existing legal frameworks if you're trying to integrate buildings or land with any kind of blockchain-based application simply because um, the state who set the laws have the monopoly of force at the moment. So regardless of how good or how well thought out your kind of, um, you know, your kind of, <laughs> your, your cryptographic substrate is, if they don't want you to have the land or don't recognize you as having it, then you don't have it in their eyes and they will take it away from you. And there are quite a few groups that are starting to engage with this in different ways. So there's a group called Decentrum, who are based in Zurich, who are currently kind of setting up the prototype for a, uh, a building which is actually owned and um, its processes are kind of mediated via a series of smart contracts. Um, so they're working quite extend, and they are actually working with legislators in, in Switzerland, um, I believe. And there are also groups like Koala, who are setting up kind of what they call as like minimum viable legal interfacing for DAOs. So how can you have DAOs existing without bringing the whole thing into the kind of legal structure that they were basically envisaged to you know to help people get out of but how can they in the the ways they need to actually still interact with it so you can actually build with them and um, both of these projects are still kind of starting out so it'll be very interesting to see where they go but the kind of TLDR of this kind of these two kind of chunks um, of, of, of findings that I've just thrown at you is that basically crypto won't actually in and of itself necessarily solve the issue. So what we need to kind of look at with building these kind of counter ecological tactics is how can we very, very strategically apply it and very strategically use it um, to kind of bolster either existing social relations um, and, you know, kind of stuff like guerrilla gardening or stuff like the project that Carl Hess was involved in. Um, and how can we essentially use it to bolster like the social relations that already exist or bring about new tiny technological solutions that kind of can incrementally help us build up into building something new and autonomous from the things we wish to gain autonomy from. So what are the actual uses of censorship resistant tech or autonomous infrastructure and how could they apply, be applied to augment um, already existing ecological counter economic actions? And I want to finish the talk by going through two other iterations of Terra Zero that we did last year 
and kind of highlighting some of the mechanisms that we were playing with and also hopefully some of the ways that we could kind of expand either kind of like vertically or horizontally going back to, to Per Boylan's point from before. And the first of these was a project that we call Flower Tokens, which um, in a certain sense you could conceptualize as a black market for flowers, which it was very much a, a small scale experiment that was actually also a technical experiment looking at um, natural resource tokenization, which led to recognitions actually of a lot of the, or recognizing a lot of the limits that actually came with crypto and how it actually really interacted with um, complex forms of social coordination, even within this kind of like tiny control case experiment. So um, it was an installation that was built in Trust, which was a co-working space in Berlin. And the system had 100, that's the pointer, yep. So it had 100 um, dahlias in it and was basically just in this four by five rack. And it had a kind of semi-automated watering system, as you can see down here. And I say semi-automated because we still had to really up, like, kind of maintain it. And this shot, or these two camera shots, which you can actually kind of just about see there, um, this shot itself is from this camera position up there. So it was monitored 24-7 um, by this camera. And in contrast to the first Terra Zero forest, it really just focused on one aspect, which was this, how do we actually kind of like tokenize real world assets? What is actually necessary to tokenize? Because obviously the process of just tokenizing everything because you can actually in itself is really something to avoid. But what is the what are the very small useful pieces of information that we can tokenize and how can we use them or why would we use them? And um, basically, this is the web interface that we set up for it, where users were able to buy, trade, and speculate on these kind of tokenized dahlias. And the state of the tokens, um, so as, oops, sorry, wrong one. So as we see here, just very simple stuff like whether it's blooming, the height, its growth rate over the previous days. Um, these were monitored by the camera that came before. So we had a program running Plant CV, which is just a plant specialized model of OpenCV, um, in order to, uh, which updated it every 24 hours. And yep. so the system just ran for three months. Like I said, it was a very small scale technical experiment. And the, uh, initially, we sold all of the flowers for 0.9 ETH, which at the time, I think was about 30 euros. I can't remember. Um, and the highest, the one that sold highest on the first day actually sold for 450 euros, which was kind of bizarre. And users could then burn their tokens and get their plants out of the system, um, which actually quite a few people did, uh, which is maybe like a, an interesting little small scale thing where a lot of people just wanted to keep the token. But then a lot, some people actually wanted to burn the token and get it out of the system, which if you just view a token as an abstract digital twin of a real life thing, it's interesting to see who did and who didn't. Um, and I haven't really, okay, yep. So basically this was some of the plant CV information that was gathered. And these are just some kind of prepping pictures of us actually planting it. So to, and these are kind of in there just to reinforce this idea that even though from these pictures, it looks like a perfectly encapsulated autonomous system, actually even trying to set something up as small scale as having 100 flowers in a rack and an automated and kind of like an automated watering system involved a lot of people doing a lot of work. Um, this is Marcus taking one of his plants out and I included this picture because one of the things this also showed us was you can't be too strict with your technology when you're engaging with nature because as you might be able to see, uh, all of the plants basically started growing way too high. So actually our kind of computer verification mechanism of actually having everything processed by OpenCV started failing because everything just started kind of smushing together into one mass or against the ceiling. Um, and so kind of taking some of this and taking some of this knowledge and seeing, okay, these are the limits of maybe why we shouldn't try to mediate everything too strictly or monitor everything too strictly. Um, we then built a project called Premnademon, which is kind of, or was examining the kind of emergent possibilities of like human and non-human interaction on 
the most granular level we could think of trying it out. And this was basically using a software framework, uh, using a decentralized software framework, um, to allow for kind of a technologically augmented organic system to engage in social and financial contracts with the broader environment, so kind of hearkening back to the idea that we were playing with in the concept paper, but really stripping it down into, okay, cool, we have a bonsai tree that's doing this instead of an entire forest, which is also far more uh, financially feasible as well. Um, so it started off as an installation and a prototype that was at the Schinkel Pavilion in Berlin, and the system itself just consisted of a bonsai tree, uh, a web interface, which this is a better picture of. Um, quite a few sensors, like two of them you can see here, which kind of existed in this ring that was sitting around it in its kind of enclosure, and a smart contract. And these software and hardware systems that it was embedded within, we kind of envisaged as almost like technological prosthe prostheses, um, which allowed it to which allowed for this creation of like a financially mediated social contract into being between the operators of whatever space it was in and Premna, the tree itself. So basically, when people committed to having the tree in their space, they committed to care for the needs of Premna demons, which are watering, trimming, trimming its leaves, making sure it has enough electricity, uh, making sure it has enough server space, and uh, the open bazaar addition at the bottom was just a bit of a wild card where people could donate to it and it would buy like nicer tools for itself to be trimmed with, which was... Um, and the way that Premna pays for this is that people engaging with it on the web interface, so as we can see here, you know, I know this is just Premna paying for all of its stuff. Um, basically, you could go onto the web interface and you could donate a bit of money to it. So the idea being that when it didn't have that much electricity left, Hopefully, someone would come in and give it you know, 50 cents worth of ether, and then Premna would ping the owners of the space it was in and say, hey, here's some money. Can you water me? Or something like that. And so this was kind of an attempt to position a very small ecological system as instead of being a passive object that needed caring for and um, constantly had to have humans watching it, it was more that Premna Demon was a way of starting to explore the potential of non-human systems to actually kind of gain the status of a semi-autonomous peer. So instead of having the interactions between human actors and the system into like a purely financialized way, it shows that you can maybe make an autonomous system that humans have to interact with on the same level of a social contract as I would were I to be buying a coffee from Paralani Paulus. Even though there is a financial transaction there, it is actually still essentially a social relation that is financially mediated, maybe. Um, and actually, what we kind of wanted to do with this, and this was toured successfully for over a year now, yeah. Um, not only can you actually create this kind of very minimal non-human autonomy, but you can actually crowdfund it just from strangers on the internet as well. And so, I suppose the conclusion of this, or what we can then bring, what, what we're kind of trying to elucidate as these tactics um, and bring into this still very nascent notion of, of counter ecologies, is some of these mechanisms we can use to kind of at least maybe tactically bolster some of the ideas that I talked about before. So these guerrilla ecological work or like self organized farming initiatives, we can maybe um, take from art pieces like Premna Demon and then actually give some form of new financial or new social autonomy to these projects. Um, or at least enable them to kind of start existing outside of the restrictive systems that they're currently placed in. Thanks. Oh, good time, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Max. Thank you yeah. for the for the presentation and now we have a time for a few questions so anybody in the audience would like to ask and follow on topics on counter ecologies okay thank you hi hey. uh, thanks for the presentation um, i'm not familiar with daos so i would like to ask in the case of premna mm -hmm. um, is there an 
artificial intelligence involved that's taking decisions. For example, it sees one day left for electricity, one day left for water. Okay, which one prioritizes, and uh, mm. how does it how does it decide for itself? Um, okay, so that's kind of a two prong question. Uh, no, there's no there's no AI or even machine learning in there really. It's just Python libraries. Um, so. In terms of the differentiation between, okay, cool, so I have this much left for water and this much left for electricity, um, we actually didn't we didn't actually build that into it. It wasn't all just one wallet that it was going into. They were each separate little wallets, right? So, um, and that was kind of partially done just to see um, what people prioritized above other things. Because, for instance, uh, on the screenshot that I had before, electricity was always running really, really low. But, for instance, and trimming it as well, which is something you have to do to keep a bonsai healthy, was usually quite low. But people would always pay for water. So it was a certain... Also seeing how you can split up the different social interactions mm -hmm. just to see uh, what would happen. Luckily, we were never in a situation where the system would have died. So, so, so you had uh, different wallets for different needs? So this, okay, because I thought there was a pool that money poured in and it then this DAO decided itself, okay. No. And the decisions were just, the decisions were super, super simple. So we just had um, a, we just had like a soil moisture sensor in the pot, for instance, and just knew that it had to keep between a certain level. Okay, thanks. No worries. Obviously you could expand this massively, but just at the time it was very minimal, just as an idea. Hello. Uh, hey. I know the talk is about well uh, close ecosystems, uh -huh. but keeping in mind that you are an ecologist person, I would like to know your thoughts about uh, global warming and the, uh, how the, the media is uh, approaching that uh, topic. How the, how the media is approaching that topic? Yeah, Greta Thunberg and all that kind of things. Uh, <laughs> I mean, complex <laughs> questions, simple yeah. answer. Big question. Um, I suppose the way that I would kind of like ground it within this is that the idea of a sing like the idea of a single consistent um, narrative with regards to global warming is actually kind of in and of itself a little bit ridiculous because obviously you can't it's far too complex a phenomenon to actually like view as a single entity, um, but also in terms of the possibilities for action and. I'll very specifically say that this idea of the individuation of the responsibility of climate change so the idea that everyone should use plastic straws and actually it's really your fault, not people who own jets or, you know, like, what, how the 100 companies that have 71, that basically commit 71% of all the CO2 emissions and all of this. Um, I would, like, that individuation of the narrative is kind of ridiculous. But then... And then it sounds slightly paradoxical to a certain extent, but you, or you can do as well, outside of, there are like two tactics you could basically take. You could go down the route of engaging with that issue. So you have 100 companies that contribute a massive amount of CO2 and trying to engage with that on some level. Or you could um, also work maybe in a way that's more akin to what people like the kind of like the solar punk movement are essentially advocating, which is like, okay, cool. The solutions aren't going to come from the top down, so maybe we just have to build them bottom up. And obviously this will start off as like a series of locale-based things, but hopefully that thing can spread and become some kind of a network. Um, yeah, I suppose that's, that's all I'd throw out. Sorry, that was a bit of a curveball of a question, so that might have been a massively incoherent answer as well, but yeah. Okay, maybe follow the anonymous response yeah, to the Greta, which was published, I think, two days ago or so. So, any last question? Who would like to have a... Ah, okay, good. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. Like, my question is a bit... So, you're trying to build this self-governing or self-organizing plant system or, like, maintaining and... Um, yeah. I um, mean, these were... Oh, sorry. sorry yeah, so... Question. So uh, maybe these are the wrong words, but like, um, so either you're trying to kind of take the human out of the loop, like, and then my question is why? And if you're not trying to take the human out of the loop, then it's my question is like, why are you doing this? Because in the end it boils down to 
people trying to preserve nature and people not trying to preserve nature and why building this restricted system around it of smart contracts and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I suppose answer to that would be um, it's not really, we're not trying to do it in as polarized a way as that. I mean, like, obviously the, the work that we were presenting there is incredibly polarized because they were kind of presented as these experiments that were presented within an art context, right? So it was more about, on a broader level, what kind of mechanisms can you actually take out of that? So for instance, with Premna, or you, if you, you can just have a system where people can pay into it, maybe people who aren't actually attached to the projects at all, um, which is an idea that actually came from the, um, I've forgotten the name of the piece now, but it was essentially like the the, um, the telegarden. So it was like a, a robot arm that was like looking after a garden that people could control from anywhere in the world over the internet. And instead of kind of trying to completely remove the humans or and kind of completely automate everything, it's more of like where can these little things fit in that maybe you could, for instance, in a more transparent way like crowdfund or you can automate certain aspects of it that could then mean that like five people could actually run a far larger area of I don't know a garden or something like that so it's really just kind of like looking at where you can slot this stuff in and experimenting with those as opposed to trying to completely remove people from it and completely automate everything because that's not either necessary or like technically feasible so it's really just kind of experimenting with okay you have certain forms of autonomy that have started to come about with stuff like DAOs, with stuff like smart contracts, and also these are experiments as well. These aren't necessarily things to be scaled and reproduced, but it's to be learned from, and maybe you learn not to do that. Um, but I think with some of the stuff, there are certain structural mechanisms we could at least take from it. Does that, is that like a, yeah? Okay, before I thank to Max, I would like to just point out if somebody would like to follow this uh, discussion maybe, I definitely recommend you at seven, if I'm right. Guys from Parallel Garden Project, which is a parallel Nepalese based, will introduce you into their work, how I work here, how they work with hydrophonics or the project of the farm boat. So definitely at seven at Institute of Crypto Anarchy. But now I would like to definitely thank to Max for his presentation. And I hope that with his project, he will not just inspire other people to think about contragology, but I was more thinking maybe a little bit infect them, you know, because that's the approach I think we need. Need to hear more. Okay, so thank you and thank you guys for coming. Cheers.